Okay. Hi, Laura. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Just uh, introduce everybody to you, uh, a good friend of ours, Laura. Thank you so much for taking time to sit down with us with Street Life Ministries, our podcast, and sharing your, your testimony, your past and present, and wherever God you feel that God is leading you in the future. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to just kind of open up in prayer and we'll pray for you, pray for those who listen to this and see this and hope that God moves in a mysterious and magical ways, right? So uh, Lord, thank you so much, God, for uh, Laura coming here and uh, sitting down with us and sharing her personal and intimate story of uh, her past and uh, what, what she went through and how you reached down and grabbed her out of her her uh, drug addiction and her homelessness and her mess, Lord. And and now you have uh, created this new uh, creation in Laura, this beautiful creation where she is now clean and sober and she gives you all the, all the glory and the credit, Lord. We pray that whoever hears this and watches this podcast or YouTube um, uh, that are struggling or, or, or not knowing whether they can turn their life around, God, that they see the hope and, and hear the hope in this uh, story, Lord. So thank you, Lord. We give you all the credit and all the glory. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. So... How long have you been sober? Um, four years and four months. How's it feel? It feels fantastic. Feels fantastic, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us. So I asked you earlier, I didn't know that you were first born in San Diego. Yes. And so just kind of give us a little backstory, mom, dad, uh, okay. childhood and stuff. So I was born um, November 6, 1977 um, at Camp Pendleton Marine Base in Oceanside, California. My dad was in the Marines. Um, we lived in married base housing until I was two, and then we moved to Rapid City um, when my dad got out of the Marines. <clears throat> so um, we lived in Rapid City. Um, I grew up, I went to like private Christian school. I started uh, when I was two years and nine months at Alpha Beacon Christian School. Um, in San Carlos and I went to private Christian school all the way through to the eighth grade and um, <clears throat> my parents when I was let's see they got divorced when I was seven so I'll start um, so when I was four and a half my mom gave birth to a um, nine pound dead baby girl um, her name is Michelle and I think that's kind of like where my story begins of like pain um, so that was the summer before I turned five, and that was July 19th, 1982. And we're coming up on her birthday again. Um, mm. So as a young child, you know, like almost five, that's just a lot to, to deal with, you know, like when you're excited um, the whole time that your mom's pregnant, you know, you're excited, like you're going to have a baby sister. It's exciting. And then to um, be in the hospital and... Um, I just remember like sitting, standing in the window, you know, like waiting for her to, you know, like when the, the nurse is bringing the babies and you're like standing like back then they used to have stairs that walked up to the, um, to the window and a, a new baby would come in and I would be asking the nurses like, is that my sister? You know, and they're, no, it's not. So I remember my dad, um, coming and like just grabbing my hand and he was just quiet and you could just tell he was really reserved. And I just, for whatever reason, I knew, like, not to ask any questions. So, um, he would just, like, grab my hand, and we went home. And I remember, like, a day or two later, my mom coming home, and she was just sad and crying. And then, um, <clears throat> I don't remember the exact time frame, maybe a week or two later, we were, um, we went to a funeral. And then, you know, obviously, when my sister would be, um, being buried, so we went to the, uh, cemetery. And I remember seeing, like, a bright light with two angels and I kept telling trying to tell my mom like look there's Michelle she's Michelle she's okay she's with the angel she's going to be fine and I think that really like freaked my mom out and so um <clears throat> from that moment forward I just my mom and I I don't know it was just a very difficult relationship like um so she never it was never really explained to me that Michelle died and then within a few months my mom was pregnant again and so the entire time she was pregnant she was stressed out, worried. Um, we had lots of doctor's appointments. I know now that, like, I, I guess apparently my sister that passed away looked just like me. And so um, that's why my mom had such a difficult time connecting with me. But when you're five, that's you don't really understand any of that. So um, 14 months later, after my mom, um, after my mom gave birth to Michelle, um, stillborn baby, <clears throat> she had my brother Jonathan. 
He was born September 29th, um, 1983. And when he was born, um, he was very sick. He was always sick. And by the time he was, I want to say, maybe nine months old, um, my dad and my mom, they um, separated. I do remember um, throughout my mom's pregnancy and after my brother was born that my dad would come home um, like angry, upset, he would be drunk, they would be yelling, screaming, which is a very chaotic time in my life and I don't, I only have some memory of it. <clears throat> anyway, so when my mom and dad got divorced, um, I was in the second grade and then by the time I was in the third grade, my mom had remarried um, to my stepdad, Joe, who is still my stepdad. And, <clears throat> um, after they got married, my mom got pregnant again, and then nine months later, she had my brother David. He was born December 22nd, 1986, and <clears throat> David and I, um, we have a really close relationship. My brother Jonathan and I, we didn't really have that close of a relationship growing up, and I think that's because my mom really latched onto him. It was really, um, I don't know if codependent is a good word for it, um, but now, here in our adult life, we have a lot of chaos going on um, currently in our in our life. Um, let's get another story. Anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> so let me just ask you real okay. quick. So, um, going back to your childhood. Yes. So, because you said Alpha Beacon. Yes. So, were you raised a Christian? Yes, I was. So, so your mom and dad believed in the Lord. Yes, and okay. that's why I grew up. And even my step my stepdad. Um, I mean, he paid for me to go to Christian school all the way okay. through to the eighth grade. Yeah. So it was. Um, it was amazing, yes. And I actually accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior when I was six um, at church. Um, we had some missionaries come from Africa, and I was like so moved by their testimony um, that I went forward and asked Jesus to be Where did you go to church when you were a kid? Calvary Baptist Church here in, Re in Redwood City. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the one right here? Yeah. Right by my house. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, let's see, where am I at, my story? So, um... Sorry, didn't mean to Oh, no, 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 it's okay. Um, so, I... Yeah, so, so that's just a background of, like, where I came from. So, I have two brothers. Um, so, your one, brother that was sick is fine now? Yeah, oh, yeah, he's fine, and he's now married, and he has um, a little girl. She's amazing. His wife's amazing. Um, and we have a really good relationship now. So, in, in being in recovery... <clears throat> so, okay, let's go. <laughs> we have a good relationship now, but it took me a while um, sure. to get there, and that's due to my drug addiction. So I grew up private Christian school, graduated eighth grade, and in high school, um, I want to say it was like my junior year, I met somebody who um, was probably not that great of an influence for me. Anyways, um, I wound up pregnant, and then I had my son. Um, I graduated pregnant from Redwood Continuation School, um, and I had my son... I first saw when I was 17, uh, had him September 5th, 1995, that's Jeffrey, and um, when he was about two years old, me and a friend of mine, <clears throat> it was the first time my mom had ever babysat Jeffrey, we went to the local pool hall here in Redwood City, it's no longer in existence, but... Um, I grew up in that pool hall. Yeah. <laughs> so my first time going to that pool hall um, with a friend of mine that I went, um, grew up in church with, we went, I ran into a boy that I used to go to my Christian school um, in 7th and 8th grade. And he entered, and he like kept going in and out of the bathroom, and I was just like really drunk, like why do you keep going in the bathroom with all these random people? Um, he was doing drugs. And so he was like, yeah, do you want to try them? And I was like, yeah, like, <laughs> of course I do. Not really realizing like then what, what it was. So anyway, so it was meth. <clears throat> I went into the bathroom at the pool hall, um, and I did a line of meth, and it was fantastic. It was amazing. It made me feel amazing. It literally took all of my problems away um, and I thought it was great and which I know I mean it wasn't great but anyway so 20 years of a roller coaster ride on and off drugs so when I first did those drugs with him um, you know then I like sought out people I never really realized like what drugs were I didn't grow up doing drugs I didn't grow up having friends that did drugs and so like these few people that I met, you know, through him, <clears throat> I would do drugs like recreationally, like on the weekends or, yeah, that went on for like about two years. And then I met uh, my first husband and I got married and he was a daily drug user. And so that was very eye opening. So I ended up becoming a daily drug user and <clears throat> he had two daughters. So I got married to him when my son was four 
and I got married, um, and I instantly had two stepdaughters, Amanda and Ashley, and they were five and seven when we got married. And um, the first few months of our marriage, he was completing um, drug court, and so it was like clean and sober. We were going to church. We were going to Reba Baptist Church here in here in Rabbit City, and we even um, they had a Christian school. We even put our kids in their Christian school, and I think that was like God, you know, just like. Um, really working in our life, you know. I mean, we I didn't know then that we would end up, you know, having this horrible roller coaster ride of drugs. But as soon as he was off of drug court, we were that was it. I mean, we were daily using drugs. It was it was pretty messy. Um <clears throat> and but our our kids did continue to go to that Christian school even though we were on drugs. Um and the pastor there, I mean we met with them, we had marriage counseling. It we ended up getting a divorce, you know, a few years later because it was just, um, it was very, I'm like shaking, I'm nervous. Um, it was just very, it was just messy. I don't really know another way. We were in and out of jail. Um, there was domestic violence mm. and it was, it was just really a bad situation all the way around. Um, so we ended up getting divorced and um, then I married a drug dealer. Um, mm. <laughs> moving up yeah Mo moving up in the world like, <laughs> so I was like I I mean like my reason for wanting to get divorced is like we can't have our kids in Christian school and be trying to live our life right but yet you know we keep doing drugs so he ended up going to jail I ended up being out on on um, bail and then I met a drug dealer and then that just seemed like a really great idea like oh you know <laughs> why not I'll just marry a drug dealer so yeah so still being well that way the drugs are readily available <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, um, so I married a drug dealer, um, and his name is Grant Coles. He's actually now in heaven. He's, mm. um, and <clears throat> we were together and then I, my, uh, bail ended up catching up with me and I went to jail and then, you know, he, my son lived with him and he would come and visit me in the jail. And then as soon as I got out of jail, I would get dirty drug tests for probation because obviously you can't be married to a drug dealer and not too drugs or I couldn't anyways. Yeah, so, imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was rough um, and that happened. So I went to jail for six months. I got out. I was out for a few months. Then I went to jail for nine months and then I got out. I was out for a few months and then the third time that I went to jail, um, they decided they were going to send me to prison because um, you, after so many times, I mean, that's it. They just, they send you to prison. So. On July 19th um, of 2007, um, which July 19th is my sister's birthday, my dead sister's birthday. So um, I got sentenced to prison and that was really, I think really hard for my mom. She was like, um, she's like, you know, so like you are going to prison, which I guess she felt like that's getting you know, completely at the double, like on my sister's birthday. Um, it was just really hard all the way around. So I got sentenced to prison on July 19th. Um, but because I had just done a county year in the county, they gave me those credits. So I only had to do um, like 90 days in prison, which isn't great anyways. Any day in prison is terrible. Um, but when I was in prison, the first day that I got to go out to um, what they call the main yard, like when you first go to prison, you're like in a holding yard and you don't, once you go over the wall to where you're gonna stay for the remainder of your time, um, you you can go to church on the main yard and the first day that I got to go out on the main yard was on a Sunday and I went to church and there was a song playing on the big huge loudspeakers and it's a song I can only imagine mm, you know that song oh yeah but it was just like so humbling like um and I was like okay god I get it you know I I don't belong here or I do belong here you know I don't this is obviously part of my journey um and have you seen the movie yeah, I've seen the oh, movie. It's yeah, it's amazing. So yeah. um, it, that song's just huge to me. You know, sure. like I can only really imagine. So <clears throat> when I got out of prison, um, it was October seventeenth. So it's like you know, like ninety days. I got out, and I, my husband, the drug dealer, um, really, you know, he was devastated that I wouldn't talk to him, but I was. I told him before I went to prison, like, I'm done. Like, I'm done. I, I'll divorce you when I get out. I'm just, I can't no longer be a part of your life because I don't want to go to prison again, you know? Like, I'm just, I'm tired, you know? I went to prison, you know, I think God worked in me to 
to turn my life over, or so I had thought. I still, I guess, apparently had some reservations. So um, <clears throat> when I got out, I was going to meetings. I was on parole. I was going to meetings. Um, and I, I wound up pregnant because I did hang out with him. And um, I ended up having an abortion on uh, February 11th. On 2008, I ended up having an abortion. And he was... Um, begged me not to have that abortion. He said, please don't have that abortion. It's going to kill me. And three years later to the very day, uh, February 11th, um, he, he did February 10th, 2011. I'm sorry. February 10th, 2008 is when I had my abortion. February 10th, 2011. He died in a high speed chase um, with the police. The, um, he was on a motorcycle. It happened here um, in San Carlos. He was on and off the freeway. His son was on the back of the motorcycle. The cops were running him on his motorcycle, and he went one way, and his motorcycle went the other, and he's now in heaven. Um, <clears throat> Wait a second. Yes. That was that was your Grant aunt? Coles. Yeah, I was married to him. Oh my gosh. My my aunt uh -huh. was a witness to that. Oh okay. Yeah. So we were not we were we were not together when it happened because I I just I couldn't be a part you know. We, we had our differences. <clears throat> but when we were together, I do want to bring up, um, I mean, I, I did bring him to church, and I do know that he's saved, and I do know that he's in heaven. You know, like that, that makes me feel better, you know, right. knowing that he's in heaven. But um, it, it was a crazy time, and I remember when he died, we weren't even in contact. We, you know, we hadn't, been, we hadn't spoken. The last time we'd spoken was a few weeks before that, and we, it just was, it was kind of messy, our conversation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, my mind just went blank. What I was going to say. It's um, okay, you're talking about Cole. Grant accepted, Cole. He accepted yeah, he Christ, did. so you know he's in heaven. Oh, okay. He, so, um, so I was staying at a friend's house, and um, my friend like woke me up in the middle of the night and was like, hey, I got to talk to you about something like I already know. Like, Grant died. He, I know. She's like, how do you know? I'm like, I had a dream about it. I had a dream that he got hit because I was a motorcycle and he died. You know, and like he came, I, I just know he's in heaven. And she's like, how could you know that? Like, I mean, he literally just got in a car accident. I mean, well, got rear-ended on his motorcycle. So I don't, I mean, I can't really even explain how I know, you know, but I, I don't know if it was a dream I had or if God just let me have a vision to know so that I could be comforted that I knew he was in heaven and they're like well they haven't even really pronounced him dead yet you know they took him by ambulance and I'm like well he's he's in heaven he's already in heaven um okay so fast forward so <clears throat> when that happened um I was I had so when I got off of parole I was back using drugs um and <clears throat> I'm trying to think of where I'm at in my story I'm so sorry <laughs> so, um, sorry. so wherever wherever you go this story is unbelievable, <laughs> yeah. so we're Thanks. good. Okay, so 2011, um, yeah, so I was on drugs, and um, Grant, he, he died, and that, I think, dro dove me. I think the reason that I ended up relapsing was because of that abortion. Like, I just, so when I got off parole, I was immediately back on, on, on drugs, it, and I think just to deal with the pain that I had went through on having an abortion, like, it, no way is that... It's murder, period, you know, but I mean, like, when you're, I, I don't know why I had it. I, anyways, so. So, wait a minute. So, really quick. So, have you and God reconciled over oh, that? Oh, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So, I know that my child is in heaven, and sure. I will one day again get to see, you know, my son or daughter. I don't even know. Um. Anyway, so, okay, so. Um, I just want to say something to you really quick. Yeah. Because, <laughs> although I, I'm, I'm totally pro-life. Yeah. Your transparency right now yeah. is unbelievable. So I just want to say thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I hope that somebody that watches this yeah. and hears this, because I know that there's a lot of people that walk around that have had had abortions and they yeah. even don't, they're not transparent about it. And um, your transparency yeah. is just unbelievable. So go ahead. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, like, um, yeah, I mean, I, like I'm, right now I'm doing a, I'm a leader in a step study group, but um, there's, I've been sharing a lot about, you know, abortion and just like what it does to you, like mentally, like I just, 
it really like you there's a lot of shame and guilt around it but i mean god can heal you 100 percent like um and i just i know that god loves me and it's just part of my story and i don't i mean i, I don't know anyway so back to where okay so in 2011 um after grant um died it, it i dove into drugs really bad like um i ended up meeting somebody who i thought was like normal who had a good job and I just I thought oh this is my chance you know like in a normal life <clears throat> well so I got together with this guy um who's Jacob's dad and I thought that that was going to be um you know my way out well he ended up losing he ended up getting laid off of his job and then ended up doing drugs with me so that was really chaotic and messy he cashed his 401k and we had a blast <laughs> and then we ended up getting arrested at um for a domestic violence at the bar here um, in Mount City. And when I went to jail, I found out I was pregnant. And so um, when I found out I was pregnant, I was like, oh, okay. So I, you know, um, I definitely don't want to have an unhealthy baby. So <clears throat> I got out and I was going to, um, I got into a program here in, in, called Hope House. Mm. And a few months in, um, when, when Jacob's dad would come to visit me, he was like on drugs and I just, his chaoticness, I let affect me. So I left the program. I was, um, but I was on drug court through, through Santa Clara County. And so, um, after two months of being at Hope House and doing pretty good, I, for whatever reason, thought it would be better for me to, um, go chase Jacob's dad and make sure he's, you know, doing what he's supposed to. So when I left the program, um, I called my probation officer and she's like, well, you, um, but you're mandated to do a, a residential program because of your history and you're pregnant. And so I was like, okay, well, then I called WRA and um, my probation officer said, I'll give you, this was on a Tuesday. She said, I'll give you to the end of the week. If you're in a program, I won't violate you. So on Friday, um, I went into Women's Recovery Association in San Mateo into their, you know, mother program and it was great but um like two or three weeks later when I went to my first because once a month when you're on drug court you have to go to to court so when I went to drug court the judge was like oh you do not get to make decisions you know on on your whereabouts like you don't get to just leave one program and go to another that's not how this works so I'm going to put you in jail until you have your baby which was miserable <laughs> so uh. my last few months of being pregnant um I which I believe was God really just rescuing me just from the chaoticness, you know, um, who knows where I would be now if I would have remained out. So I'm grateful for it now. I wasn't then, but I am now. It took me a while to get there. Um, so I spent my last like two and a half months um, of being pregnant in jail. And then I gave birth to Jacob um, in the county hospital with my ankle cuffed to the bed, you know. <laughs> I, they uncuffed it so I could push, but anyway, so um, I gave birth to Jacob um, October 11th, 2012, um, 9 pounds, 12 ounces, very healthy. Um, he was 10 days late. Um, <laughs> he was comfortable. Yeah. Nine, nine pounds? Nine pounds, 12 ounces. Goodness. Yeah. How old? Wait, really quick. I was 35 when I had him. How, how um, big was your uh, sister? She was nine pounds. Yeah. She was wow. Nine, yeah. Kind of interesting. So, yeah, so, um, so when I, so, sorry, this, so I, so after I had him, the judge did tell me though, um, like once I gave birth that she would let me go to a residential program, back to WRA, because I really wanted to go there. So when, after I had him, um, I was in the hospital for a couple days with him, and then he went home with my mom, and I went back to jail, and then <clears throat> about... I think two or three days later, the judge brought, she heard that I was back, you know, from having my baby and she brought me into her court, um, which was like, she was like at a different courthouse, but she kept her word, you know? So she brought me in to, um, the court that she was in and she said, um, I'm going to release you to your mom. And you know, you have, I don't remember, I think maybe like 30 days to get into residential, which I think it took me, I don't know, less than a week to get back into WRA. So <clears throat> I went into WRA and I spent my first, Jacob's first year of life in WRA. Um, and it was amazing, you know. Um, 
I learned how to function everyday life, you know, without the use of drugs, something that, I mean, I spent 20 years, you know, like on and off of drugs. And it's really, I think you just, you don't even know how to, you get so comfortable being uncomfortable that you really don't even know how to live. It's like, it's pretty, I know it sounds bizarre and crazy, but you just don't. And it's so living, um, a Debra gave me like kind of like the tools, you know, like we took the bus to, you know, to the, um, to our program and we went grocery shopping, like just normal things that normal people do every day that, um, I think you just don't really realize you don't know how to do without the use of drugs when you've done them for so many years. Um, so when I got out of WRA, um, I, when I was in WRA, my son lived with, um, with my oldest son lived with my mom, uh, during that year and then when we when I got out of WRA he lived with me in the shelter we lived in the shelter for probably a, almost a year and then we moved into um I got like housing like temporary housing and I moved into um, a house here in Redwood City on Davis Street <laughs> and um I had some difficulty with Jacob's dad um I'll leave that part out um like what the specifics are because that's his journey. Um, but anyways, it took me through a tailspin of relapse. And I just, I had a very hard time accepting um, the things that I had found out about him. And so I ended up relapsing. Um, and it was pretty bad, um, my relapse. And I want to say for, it was like right after Jacob's second birthday that I relapsed. And for the first year, I was just kind of like in denial. I kind of was like almost agoraphobic. I didn't even leave my house, like at all for anything. Sorry, my phone's going off. Let me just take it out of my pocket. It stops vibrating. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, so for the first year, um, and I, it, it was pretty rough. And then, um, and then for the second year, I kind of just started letting people come around my house a lot, and it was pretty bad. Um, yeah, your house was pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Like 1129 Davis Street, yes. Um, and I had everybody at my house. It, my house was a hot spot for stripping wire in the backyard. <laughs> um, just anything and everything. Anybody who needed a place to stay would come and crash. Not necessarily in my house because I tried to keep people out of my house because Jacob lived in there. And I guess that was my justification, how I justified like, oh, well, Jacob's safe, you know, because I'm not letting people do drugs in my house. They're doing drugs in the garage or they're doing drugs in the back, in a tent in the backyard or they're doing drugs in the shed. Um, anyways, so, but um, the last, so the Red City Police Department, they came to my house all the time. Like, I mean, all the time. <laughs> So much that my landlord decided that she didn't want me in her house anymore. And she's like, I'm done renting to you. And um, she even tried to evict me. And I say tried because it, she had to take me to court and it was very difficult. Um, the power got shut off at my house. Um, I had an amazing neighbor that lived behind me that ran an extension cord so that I could um, run a heater for Jacob and a television. Um, it's just insanity, like what you allow when you're on drugs. Like, mm -hmm. um, it definitely is the devil. Um, he just, you know, gets in there, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and he really does a pretty good job of it, you know. Um, so <clears throat> the police were coming on a regular basis to my house. Um, I ended up getting evicted, and even though I got evicted, I still didn't leave. Um, I had pg &E now, you know, because somebody had like wired my pg &E and the guy came out, he's like, you're gonna end up blowing up the whole neighborhood. But like, you're not thinking of that when you're just trying to have electricity in your house. Um, so when the police finally came, um, well, if I wanna say maybe a week before they came and actually like locked me out of my house. Um, I had, I'm trying to think of exactly, I'm like trying to blank on the exact name of all the officers that came out. I had several officers come and ask me, like, do you want help, basically? And I was like, I am was at this point, like, desperate. Like, yeah, I, I definitely want help. I definitely don't want to live like this. It's crazy. Um, that and my older son, who um, was 21 at the time, was just like, mom, I can't. 
I cannot keep picking up the pieces of your broken life. Like, uh, Jacob is not going to be able to survive the way I survived. Like, uh, my older son was like, uh, would tell me, there's no, there's no gangster anywhere in that little boy. Nowhere. Like, there's no, I mean, I don't mean like gangster, but just there's no, there's no streets there's no street smarts in that kid there's no little thug anywhere inside of him and he's just not going to survive how i survived and um i mean that broke my heart i mean like it's your job as a parent to tough love your kids but when your kid is tough loving you it's like a real wake-up call you know um but i thank god that he you know, loved me enough to do that. And if it was anybody else, I probably wouldn't have listened. Um, But my older son, I mean, he literally, I had him at 17 and he was like my ride or die, you know, little partner. I mean, he, I mean, I feel bad now. I mean, I drug him kind of through the mud, but through it all, he was almost like my rock, you know. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus Christ is my rock. (laughs) Amen. But, you know, I mean, I do believe that, you know, I mean, God gives you your kids for a reason, you know, and I believe that God, you know, gave me my son and he was, you know, he loved me enough to, you know, to just kind of speak truth. Yeah, speak truth into me and and into my heart and it, you know, and it stung. Like, and so when, um, when the police asked, you know, hey, would you like to, you know, meet with, um, I had came to Street Life Ministries, you know, I had been, you know, came several times, even on drugs, you know. Came, I mean, I do, you know, I always believed in God, but um, I would come and um, sometimes just for the dinner, you know, like for Jacob, a hot meal. Um, <clears throat> but uh, when they said, you know, hey, you know, would you be open to talk to Sean, you know, um, from Street Life Ministries? And I'm like, yeah, of course. So, you know, maybe she can help you with some housing, you know, like because I was getting evicted. So a few days, so I, I did, I came and I met with Sean. Um, and a couple police officers. We met um, the sandwich place, and um, so I know one of them was Bill Cogno. Yeah, Bill Cogno. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I say it wrong. Yeah, I, I, I know people say Cogno. I know. Yeah, I, I, I and was uh, Sergeant Dan. Yeah, Dan Smith. Dan Smith. Yeah, I love him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do, so a lot of people do. He's, yeah. he's awesome. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. So I know. I know. Really quick, just so people hear, yeah. hear a little bit of context. So we lived re- really, like literally around the corner from you, where your house was on <laughs> okay. Davis. We live on uh, really? Hudson and Roosevelt. Oh, wow. So she re- she went over there. As soon as, you know, we have a really amazing relationship yeah. with the Redwood City Police and guys like uh, Dan Smith and Bill Cogno and a few other officers, when they would yeah. call us, we're like on it. Yeah. You know, and I'll never forget, my wife went over to your house yeah. and met with you. <laughs> And she came back, and she's like, "Oh boy," <laughs> and I go, "What?" And she goes, "This is going to be a tough one." Yeah. And they, and we started praying. Yeah. And um, so anyway, power. Go. There's power in prayer. Oh, there's a lot of power yeah. in prayer. My yeah. wife, my wife is, I love my wife. She's my, she's <laughs> my best friend. She's somebody that I rely on a lot. But when she sees someone like you, yeah. she's a bulldog. Yeah. <laughs> she won't give up. Yeah. Well, praise God. <laughs> yeah. So um. So a few days after she came to the house to talk to me, um, the, you know, they came and they basically, you know, knocked down my door, Mm -hmm. um, and they locked me out. And so, um, I didn't have anywhere to go. And, um, Sean had set up so that I could stay. Um, I stayed at a, I can't even remember the name of the hotel I stayed at. So I stayed at a hotel for, um, for two nights Mm -hmm. before I could get into, um, the shelter that she helped me get into the shelter, the, um, in San Mateo. Family. First step for families. First yeah. Family, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't do a blank. And so um, I stayed in a hotel for two nights, and um, my older son wouldn't even stay with me at the hotel. He's like, I'm not staying with you at the hotel. I'm going to go stay with my dad. And I'm just, I'm not doing this. Like, I can't. And that to me was devastating because through everything I've been through, he's always been there, you know, always, always. He's just always been my rock, always been there. So I would be like, just devastated and so when I went to after two nights I went to the shelter and when I was at the shelter even the um I was still doing drugs like my stuff was in storage and I was I would leave during the day to go get high in my storage and Jacob would be riding around on his bicycle outside the storage unit and I just I couldn't 
I could not get it together. And I, you know, Sean would be messaging me like, hey, you know, how's it going? And I'm like, it's, it's not <laughs> like I'm miserable. Um, and she said, well, you know, I really think you should, you know, see about getting into a program. And so, you know, she made some phone calls, you know, to different programs. And my, um, when I had my, you know, a few days into the shelter, you have to have your meeting one-on-one -on -one with your, whoever your counselor is that they give you at the shelter. And so when I met with her, she's like, you know, you still haven't went to go do your drug test. And I'm like, well, that's because I'll fail it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a waste of money to take a drug test when I can tell you I'm on drugs. You know, I can't make curfew because the bus, you know, like I missed the bus. And it was just super chaotic. So <clears throat> I ended up getting into WRA and I was there for a few weeks. And with it, um, when I was done with WRA, um, my mom came um, to pick me up and I moved to Manteca. And... Um, I think after I had been clean and sober, I came to also, I want to say maybe after 90 days, I came um, to Street Life Ministries, yep. um, you know, just for a brief few minutes, you know, just to check in with you guys and talk. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I don't even think I talked much. I think I just cried. Um, <laughs> so when I, um, there's healing in tears though. So when I first moved to Manteca, um, I joined a church there. And, um, well, actually, when I was first church shopping, you know, like going to different churches to see where I could fit in, um, I went to a church, and I honestly don't even remember the name of it. All I remember is the message was so powerful. It was, like, about, you know, your children and just, like, the power that the Holy Spirit has in healing you. And I was... I, I went up to altar call, and the pastor's daughter, like, laid hands on me, and I literally could just feel... Like the Holy Spirit, like residing inside of me, and like there's this evil darkness leaving me. And it was then, and then a, a few weeks later, it was Easter, and I got baptized at the church that I now still belong to. Um, I think I rededicated my life. I don't think I know. I rededicated my life to Jesus Christ, and that was four years ago. Four, yeah, a little over four years ago. And um, in this last four years, I have. Um, I have, um, I became a part of what they call Celebrate Recovery, and it's very similar to like AA and NA, except for that it's Bible-based, so mm -hmm. it's, um, it's basically like sometimes in NA and AA you can have like a doorknob as your higher power, which I think is kind of odd, but um, in Celebrate Recovery, it 100% focuses on Jesus Christ, like um, Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ is basically doing for me what I could never do for myself. That's right. Um, and... I've went through the 12 steps when I when I first got in there I went through the first 12 steps I went through a 12 step um, women's group and I had a lot of healing a lot of tears and then I co-led a step study um, a 12 steps 12 step study women's group and then now I'm currently a leader of our 12 of our celebrate recovery running a 12 step program and helping other women to um, That's awesome. yeah um, in the last, <clears throat> so four years ago when I first moved to Manteca, one of the reasons I moved is my grandmother, my mom's mom, um, she was in the hospital in Oklahoma, and they were going to put her, like, in a home. Who's this? My mom's mom. Okay. My grandma. So she moved, she was moving to Manteca, and my mom was like, you know, why don't you just come live with us? You can help take care of grandma. You know, they're threatening to put her in a home in Oklahoma, and, you know, I don't want her to die in a home. So... I did. I moved to Manteca, and I um, helped take care of my grandma, and she only lasted about five months, and then she died. She went to be with Jesus. But in that time of taking care of her, like, um, there's hospice workers that come in, and I just really felt that Jesus, this is something Jesus was, like, calling me to do, was to, like, um, I don't know, work for hospice or just take care of older people in general. But the thing is, is when you've been to jail and you've been to prison and you have um, had drug addiction, like um, they don't let you work in the medical field. And so I was like talking to my um, celebrate recovery pastor about this and he said, well, you serve an almighty God, you know, that can do, you know, miraculous things. And so I just clung on to that and um, I went there, um, I looked up Modesto Junior College um, and I signed up for a certified nurses assistant class, knowing that I probably wouldn't even be able to do it. Um, but I went in and I talked to the woman. I'm like, you know what? I, um, 
I really have a heart for this and I want to do this. And she said, well, just take the class. And when the time comes to get your license, you know, you can just deal with it then. So I took the class and um, December of 2019, I graduated um, from the survey nurses assistant class. And, you know, they do that. Um, in order to get your license, you have to fill out this paper, you know, live scan and um, it's a criminal clearance. And so I, I got in the mail a letter from, from the California Department of Public Health with this long list of reasons why I could not work in the medical field. But if I wanted to write a letter to have them, you know, excused, you know, it, it, it's an option. So <clears throat> I did. I wrote a letter. <laughs> and um, then COVID hit. And so it took a really long time for them to approve it. But in November, I also had to have character witness letters. And so I had five um, different people from my church write letters on my behalf. And in November of 2020, um, I got a letter from the California Department of Public Health that I was approved to work in the medical field. So, That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. God so, does move mountains on. Yeah. So, um, you know, through it all, like, yeah, so I'm a certified nurse's assistant. And then um, when COVID... I still wanted to be a home health aide. Like that was like my, you know, I wanted to be able to go into people's homes and, you know, if it's painting some little old lady's toes and singing to her about Jesus or, I mean, like they're on their way out. So if I could change, you know, like their destination for eternity, that really, it, it meant something to me. So, um, that's what Sean does. Yeah, that's what she was saying. Yeah. So, yeah, so it just really spoke to me. So like the people that came out and um, helped take care of my grandma, like the hospice workers um, that came out and helped take care of her, they were just very kind um, to her and that it really, it meant a lot to me. So yeah, so if there's, if I could help somebody in their destination for eternity, um, that it, it just really, it really means something to me. So, um, so I did, I took the home health aid class and I got that license as well. And I'm now currently, um, I have two different um, caretaker jobs that I'm doing right now. Um, I have one, a 96 year old woman who um, <clears throat> I take care of on Sundays. I help like bathe her and we actually watch church online together. Um, and then I have another woman who I'm taking care of who's 83 and I am able to go in. She actually really likes to be read too. <laughs> so my five hours that I'm there, two days a week, I actually spent the majority of the time reading to her like Christian books, um, and it's really, it's really fascinating. Um, so I really am enjoying that. <clears throat> um, other than that, so that's like really exciting that God opened up those doors for me, and then um, so I'm actually, I'm able to you know be more present for my son who is very involved in a lot of sports and <clears throat> this job that I'm able to do now like I will so when school starts I'll be able to work around like his school schedule which um, he goes to private Christian school which is really important to me um, I'm trying to think of other things that are going on in my life that are 100% just from God and God alone um, I so I have a quick question. Yeah. So I know just because just, okay. you're talking about yeah. your son and you're talking about recovery. So Jacob. Yes. So he's eight. He's eight. And how and how has he adjusted to your guys' new life? So I am blessed that he never really had to I mean, other than the two years he lived in that chaoticness, like the last four years I've been able to um, have him like in Christian school and make a better life for him so that he doesn't have to, you know, suffer the way that my older son suffered. Sure. Yeah, what I see on Facebook, <laughs> yeah. he has, I mean, he just seems so joyful, so filled with the Spirit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm amazed. Why, I, get, I get to watch your life kind of play out through social media, yeah. and I've just watched this and young boy's huge, life. Yeah, it's a huge blessing. So, like, God has really been able to work in my life, and I'm able to be, like, present and actually like enjoy it not that I didn't enjoy my other son but like I li I'm not my brain isn't fogged by drugs or alcohol and I'm just filled with the Holy Spirit you know and I'm able to enjoy everything you know I get to take him to Christian school I get to enjoy it like 
I just, it's amazing to be able to be fully present and to enjoy your kids is like, I created, well, God created him, yeah. but like I get to really actually be there present, fully present and able to enjoy all of it. And where, what's it's your amazing. relationship like with your older son? We have a very good relationship. It's gotten better. Oh yeah, he must. So, he must, because he's seen you go through a lot. Yeah, so, so he, he was always. Blessed. Yeah, so he was always there for me. And um, recently, um, we've been me and my two brothers have been having some um, some battles with our mom. Um, so I could definitely use prayer in that category. Sure. Um, and my mom is a little bit emotionally unhealthy, not a little, she's a lot emotionally unhealthy and a little bit toxic. And so <laughs> we've been meeting, like, um, we've had two meetings and then I just had a meeting, um, a few days ago with my pastor of celebrate recovery with my mom, just trying to set healthy boundaries and, um, it's difficult. And so in this, I was like, um, I would be devastated as a mom if my children didn't want to speak to me and my two brothers, especially my brother that has that's married with a child, he doesn't want to talk to my mom because of just the unhealthy chaoticness that goes on um, in the family dynamics. And I, because I have children, I can feel for her, you know, as, as a parent, like I would be devastated if my kids didn't want to talk to me. So I try to have a healthy relationship with her in spite of, you know, like her unhealthy I don't know, lifestyle. I don't even know the correct words to use and to describe it. But um, I think hurt people hurt people. And when I went, when I first got into recovery, um, I had to like forgive her, even if she wasn't sorry for things that she has said and done um, so that I can move on in my life and not stay stuck in the, um, I guess, in the chaos. And so <clears throat> God has helped me to heal from like, you know, our broken relationship. Um, but in this, I, it brought up issues between me and my older son. So like I have, um, even though I've apologized to him and made amends um, to him. So on Sunday, when I had this meeting with my pastor and my mom, I was, um, after the meeting, I called my older son and I was like, I really want to make sure that you understand that I apologize for any pain or discomfort I put you through, you know, in, in life, you know, I would never want to inflict anything on you, you know, like, I just hope that you forgive me and that you understand that I'm trying to do everything I can to better my life. And he said, mom, I, I have forgiven you and I do forgive you and I do love you. And I, what I want is for you to make a better life for your son, you know, well, for Jacob, you know, so that he never has to go through the things that I went through as a kid. And that's just like, it's, good as it feels to hear that it also is painful it's like you know I really did cause him you know a lot of unnecessary pain and hurt but the fact that he can forgive me it is amazing you know but that's we serve a God that you know can restore relationships so I'm happy that I have a restored relationship with him and I'm happy that um you know that we get a I get to have a be a positive person in his life now it's it's very exciting it still is a little bit painful that I don't have that kind of a relationship with my mom. It, it is, and it's something that I pray about <laughs> a lot. So I just pray that God can, you know, heal her, I guess is really, um, yeah, so I... The good thing is, <laughs> is that in your process now, you're in a place where you see the toxic yeah. from your mom. Yeah. So you're able to recognize that and keep, keep boundaries away from it yeah. so you're not part of the toxicness. Yes. So even though you want to have a close relationship with your mom, you really do in some ways because you're able to keep a safe boundary between yourself, your recovery, your relationship with God, and the drama that she's in. Yeah. Which is actually, in a lot of ways, it's good. Yeah, it is. You know? It still is. It's still painful. Though, sure. You know, like, you know, I try to include her as much as I can, like, in some of Jacob's activities, you know, like, I mean... He's on the swim team, so, you know, he has these swim meets on the weekend, you know, he's BMX bike racing, you know, yeah. and, like, I want to invite her to all these things, but then when she comes, sometimes it's just chaotic, and it's like, I have to bite my tongue and pray, like, God, you created her, and I know that she's an amazing person, you know, I just, I just pray for healing, really, I, I just pray, I, he, I hope that she can get to a place that she's, like, happy and healthy. Right, so is he into BMX bikes? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And like, he likes to race them? Yeah. So I'm actually friends with a professional oh. BMX bike racer. Yeah, this is something new. So <clears throat> Jacob, um, there's 
at Spreckles BMX Park, which is right down the street from our, um, our apartments. They race like every weekend and um, he really has been showing interest. So um, I got him a bike. He had a Walmart bike, <laughs> but the brakes broke. So um, we saved up some money and we got him a better bike from the, from the shop. And um, he's been racing, he's done four races now. And he first he got fifth, then he got fourth, <laughs> then he got second, and then last night he got third. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Mm. I never even knew that BMX, I, I didn't even know that it was like a thing. But so I'm going to see if I can that, get this guy to meet your son. Oh, that would be So he, does, he goes all around the country. Oh, how cool. He's a, he's, I went to high school with him. He's, oh, wow. he's in his 50s and oh. he does this professionally. Yeah. He's like sponsored and everything. Oh, that's so yeah, cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Actually, he, I reconnected with him through Sergeant Dan. Oh, wow. So Dan <laughs> used to arrest him a lot and, oh. and he turned his life around. And, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. I yeah, know. It's like well, we're on one side, you're you know, in handcuffs, and then all of a sudden you, you save your life, and next uh, thing you know, yeah. you're friends, right? So. Yeah. Well, we I mean, really I, are friends all, all the way through it, though. Yeah. Well, Officer Santiago, I can remember like before, like years ago, one time, um, he had arrested me, and we were in the car. I, you know, I'm in the back seat, and he's like, "Is there anything you'd like, you know, anything you'd like me to do? You know, can I help you with something?" I'm like, "Yeah, you can pray for me." <laughs> That's what you can pray for me, and then I remember like years later, like you know, running into him again. Well, any officers, they're like, they all know my name, they all know my last name, my date of birth, and they can rattle off every address I've lived in in Redwood City. <laughs> Like, but just pray for me. So any officer, when they ask, is there something, you know, you need help with? I'm like, yeah, I need a lot of prayer. So <laughs> but those I, prayers have paid off. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah.